title of this conference is The Sacred Heart and the French Revolution. Um, and actually, this, this presentation actually could be called The Sacred Heart of Jesus, the divine force that could have prevented the French Revolution. Now, dealing with a topic like the Sacred Heart of Jesus is quite a humiliating experience. It's very humbling. Because there's such a wealth of information that could be covered because the history and the devotion itself is so rich that what I'm going to be giving here is really not even a brief sketch. You could spend your life studying uh, the Sacred Heart. But what I hope to be able to accomplish for all those who hear this is my goal is to try and take devotion to the Sacred Heart out of the humdrum of existence that we've allowed it to fall into. Uh, what I mean is that for us, and especially for cradle Catholics, uh, devotion to the Sacred Heart is nothing new. It's been part of our Catholic furniture since we were children, and um, for many of us it's become commonplace. We have parishes named after the Sacred Heart, we have schools named after the Sacred Heart, we even have softball teams named after the Sacred Heart. And because it's so commonplace, we run the risk of forgetting the devotion to the Sacred Heart is one of the most important, most profound, and most preeminent of all Catholic devotions. So, this talk is going to be really divided into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about the history of the devotion. Secondly, we're going to have a brief discussion of exactly what devotion to the Sacred Heart is. And third, we're going to discuss how the Sacred Heart could have prevented probably the greatest catastrophe of modern times, the French Revolution. So, first for the history. On July 22nd, 1647, Margaret Mary Alacoque was born in an obscure village in Burgundy, France. And she was always a pious little girl, and by the age of nine she was already attracted to the religious life. Years later, after many trials and difficulties, she entered the Visitation Convent in Pereira Miel on May 25th, 1671. She was 24 years old. Now, while in the convent, she emanated to a high degree every virtue that was proper to her state. But one of the most fascinating features of this early period is her ardent love of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Her devotion to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament was true constant and intense. It's one of the most striking features of her life, uh, of her biography, before the revelations of the Sacred Heart actually take place. And she would literally spend hours before the Blessed Sacrament on her knees, practically in an ecstatic state. Now, though there were a series of manifestations to St. Margaret Mary, the revelations concerning the Sacred Heart are usually summed up in three grand revelations. And this is, this is going to be quoted directly from St. Margaret Mary's own writings. The first revelation concerning the Sacred Heart took place on December 27, 1673, on the Feast of St. John the Evangelist. Now, the fact that the first revelation took place on the Feast of St. John the Evangelist is of utmost significance because, as we're going to explain in part two of this talk, the Sacred Heart is actually the symbol of Christ's love. First, St. John the Evangelist was the disciple that Jesus loved. Uh, that's how he's referred to in Scripture, and it was he who rested his head upon our Lord at the time of the Last Supper. Now, of course, we know that our, loved all, our, our, our Lord rather, loved all the disciples, but he obviously maintained a particular tenderness towards St. John. Second, it is in the Gospel of St. John where we meet the most striking verses of our Lord's love, and in particular, greater love than this no, no man has, that he laid down his, down his life for his friends. And in John we read, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever will believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Three, it was St. John who was the lone apostle at the time of the crucifixion, and who witnessed, he witnessed the opening of our Lord's side with the lance. And we know that uh, this lance that opened our Lord's side also pierced his sacred heart. And four, fourthly, it 
was St. John who appeared to St. Gertrude in the 13th century, and he predicted to St. Gertrude the establishment of devotion to the Sacred Heart. He said that this devotion was being reserved for subsequent, subsequent ages when the world, having grown cold, will have, will have need of it to rekindle its love. And now, on December 27, 1673, the world had become sufficiently cold, primarily due to the spread of Protestantism in Europe, and particularly Calvinism and Jansenism in France. Jansenism being a Catholic heresy. 1673, December 27. And the, the world was about to become much colder when the first revelation of the Sacred Heart took place. Here's what St. Margaret Mary writes. She said, once being before the Blessed Sacrament, and having a little more leisure than usual, I felt wholly filled with this divine presence, and so powerfully moved by it that I forgot myself and the place which I was. I abandoned myself to this divine spirit and yielded my heart to the power of his love. He made me rest for a long time on his divine breast, where he revealed to me the wonders of his love and the inexplicable secrets of his sacred heart which he had hitherto kept hidden from me. Now he opened it to me for the first time, but in a way so real, so sensible, that it left me no room for doubt, though I am always in dread of deceiving myself. Close quote. Now the first message from our Lord was relatively short. Here's what our Lord said. Quote, My divine heart is so passionately in love with men that it can no longer contain within itself the flames of its ardent charity. It must pour them out by thy means and manifest itself to them to enrich them with its precious treasures, which contain all the grace which they need to be saved from perdition. He then added, quote, I have chosen thee as an abyss of unworthiness and ignorance to accomplish so great a design so that all may be done by me. Now, for the next six months after this first revelation, everything returned to the quiet, orderly convent life that Margaret Mary had been leading. But when the second grand revelation took place in 1674, it was to be even more dramatic than the first. Now, the exact date is not really known, uh, but there are many who believe that it took place sometime in the beginning of June in 1674, on the Friday within the octave of Corpus Christi. That's a speculation. Now again, I'm taking this directly from St. Margaret Mary's own writings, which she wrote under obedience. Quote, Once when the Blessed Sacrament was exposed, my soul being absorbed in extraordinary recollection, Jesus Christ, my sweet master, presented himself to me. He was brilliant with glory. His five wounds shone like five suns. Flames darted, flames darted forth from all parts of his sacred humanity. Can you imagine such a sight? This is apocalyptic terminology. Flames darted forth from all parts of his sacred humanity, especially from his adorable breast, which resembled a furnace, and which opening displayed to me his loving and amiable heart, the living source of these flames. Rose quote. Now, Margaret Mary was understandably trembling with emotion, and her eyes were riveted on him. She writes, he unfolded to me the inexplicable wounds of his pure love, and to what an excess he had carried it for the love of men, from whom he had received only ingratitude. Our Lord then said, quote, This is much more painful to me than all I have suffered in my passion. If men rendered me some return of love, I should esteem little all I have done for them, and should wish, if such could be, to suffer it over again. But they meet my eager love with coldness and rebuffs. Do you at least, he concluded, console me by supplying as much as you can for their ingratitude. Close quote. Now, there's more to this episode that we don't have time for here. But suffice it to say that our Lord had asked her to make a special reparation by receiving Holy Communion on each first Friday. This is the first mention we have of the first Fridays and to make a holy hour of reparation from Thursday from 11 p.m. until midnight. Now, Margaret Mary lived in a convent, so for this, she would have to obtain permission. Now, the Mother Superior, who was immediately made aware of all these events, as you might expect, she wasn't all that thrilled with the news. Um, she might have thought 
the same thing that we're tempted to think when we hear about something like this. Oh great, just, the, just what the world needs, another visionary. Now, you have to understand the concern of a prudent director of souls when a problem like this is placed on their laps. Because the big question in the director's mind is, what exactly am I dealing with here? Now we know the scripture says, despise not prophecy, it's true. But it also says with the same infallible authority, test the spirit to see if it comes from God. So Mother Superior may have thought, well, am I dealing here with another Saint Gertrude whose revelations are profound and true and which are a shining light to the church even to this day? Or am I dealing with a very good, well-meaning, pious young woman who has an oversized imagination and who really believes that she's seeing and hearing things that just aren't there? Or could it be possible, and then the true horror hits, is it possible that I am dealing with another Magdalene of the Holy Cross? Now, Magdalene of the Holy Cross was a Franciscan nun who lived in Cordoba, Spain about a hundred years previously. She was a nun who had the stigmata who levitated, who manifested all sorts of mystical phenomena, who, when she received communion, the host would detach itself from the priest's hands and sail through the air and land on her tongue. She announced the defeat of the, and the imprisonment of Francis I by the Spanish army in Pavia, way before news of the event uh, came to the town by normal messengers who was venerated and consulted with by priests, bishops, and even emperors, and who, in a near-death confession, confessed that when she was a young shepherdess, she had sold her soul to the devil, so that in return, he would give her power to perform prodigies. See, Magdalene of the Holy Cross, through cooperation of demonic forces, fooled practically the whole of Spain for the 16th century for years. And now, Mother Superior says, here's another young nun, my care, my convent, claiming to have visions. What do I do? Now remember, we know the end of the Margaret Mary Sacred Heart story. Mother Superior didn't. And she alone was responsible for Sister Margaret's soul. So Mother Superior is gonna to have to rely on prayer, her learning, her own wits, and the counsel of others in whom she has confidence. Well, her learned counselors said exactly what you would expect them to say. They said that it's probably not God, that the whole thing is most likely the result of a, of a pious and vigorous imagination, and we can't rule out evil either, either the possibility of a skillful demonic deception. Now, Mother, Margaret Mary, understandably, was heartbroken. She was condemned by her superior, condemned by her confessor. But during these difficulties, our Lord did comfort her. She seemed to hear our Lord say, have patience and wait for my servant. And to make a very long story short, it was eventually Saint Claude de Colombier who would come to the convent in order to give some spiritual conferences to the nuns. He would meet and speak with Sister Margaret Mary. And this good priest, would become the, the primary instrument of assuring St. Margaret Mary, and many others as well, the genuineness of, of, the, of, the, of the revelations of the Sacred Heart. And he would also, uh, Claude de Colombier, would also become one of his most zealous propagators up into the time of his early death. Uh, though he died in, in France, his death was brought on uh, prematurely by some brutal treatment he had received in Britain uh, at the hands of the Protestants there. Now, what is called the last grand revelation took place on June 16th, 1675. And this is when St. Margaret Mary was invested with a grand public mission. It was during the octave of the Feast of the Blessed Sacrament that Margaret Mary was on her knees in front of the choir grate, her eyes again always fixed on the tabernacle. Suddenly our Lord appeared at the altar and revealed his sacred heart. Here's what the Lord said. He said, Behold this heart which has loved men so much that it has spared nothing, even to exhausting and consuming itself, 
in order to testify to his love. Yet in return I receive from the greater part only ingratitude by their irreverence and sacrilege and by the coldness and contempt they exhibit me in this sacrament of love. In other words, the blessed sacrament. And what is most painful to me, he added, is that there are hearts consecrated to me. Then he commanded her to have established in the church a particular feast in honor of his sacred heart. Quote, I desire, therefore, that the first Friday after the octave of the Blessed Sacrament be observed in a special manner as the feast of my heart, by receiving Holy Communion on that day and making reparation for the indignity that it has received. I promise that my heart shall bestow its love abundantly on those who will render me this honor or who will cause the same to be rendered by others. Close quote. Now, 14 years later, in 1689, there was another startling revelation made to St. Margaret Mary, the consequences of which we are still living through this, to this day. But we'll return to that a little later on. Now, it's not the purpose of this presentation to give a detailed account, a detailed account of the ins and outs of how devotion to the Sacred Heart and the Feast of the Sacred Heart was finally approved. Just to suffice it to say that anything our Lord wills, will eventually come to be. In 1765, Pope Clement XIII gave approval to an office and mass in honor of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and devotion to the Sacred Heart spread rapidly. The Venerable Pope Pius IX extended the feast to the whole church, and Pope Leo XIII consecrated the entire human race to the Sacred Heart of Jesus in June of 1899. He considered this one act to be the most important act of his pontificate. But now, on a more personal level, I want to deal with the question, exactly what is devotion to the Sacred Heart? Well, first of all, it should be noted that devotion to the Sacred Heart didn't really start with St. Margaret Mary. Its history goes back to the earliest devotions of our Lord, uh, the, the devotion of his five holy wounds. It goes right back to there. Because the lance that I said earlier, the lance that opened our Lord's side, also pierced his sacred heart. And this devotion in kernel form has been with the church from the very beginning. We see it in the writings of St. Bernard, St. Gertrude, St. Francis de Sales, and primarily in its most enthusiastic supporter, St. John Eudes. You just heard St. John Eudes quoted by Cornelia. But that's just the history. What we want to find out is, what exactly is devotion to the Sacred Heart? Now, because this sort of question should only be answered by someone who is a true master of the spiritual life, I'm going to answer it by quoting to you um, from one of the greatest masters of the spiritual life of the 20th century. I quoted him earlier this, this week. The great Benedictine abbot Marmion, who died on January 30th, 1923. His books, as I said, Pope Benedict XV, of his works, Saint ben uh, Pope Benedict XV said, read it, it is the pure doctrine of the church. Now, in his beautiful chapter, The Heart of Jesus, that's contained in his famous book called Christ and His Mysteries, Abbot Marmion defi defines devotion to the Sacred Heart as follows. He says, quote, devotion to the Sacred Heart is devotion to the divine person himself, manifesting his love for us and showing us his heart as a symbol of that love. I'm going to say that again. Devotion to the sacred heart is devotion to the divine person himself, manifesting his love for us and showing us his heart as a symbol of that love. Now, we're going to explain this following the outline of uh, Abbot Marmion by answering three basic questions. Three questions, incidentally, you're going to see each one of them that contain the exact same answer. First, what is the one outstanding perfection that shines forth in all of Christ's mysteries? Answer, it is love. Second, from another aspect, what is the one driving force of all the apostles, and particularly that of St. Paul? The answer again is love. 
And thirdly, what is the one primary element that all the, de the devotions to the person of Jesus Christ have in common? Answer again is love. Now he goes on to explain what he means. First point, the one outstanding perfection that shines forth in all of Christ's mysteries is love. And on this point, Abbot Marmion says that it was love that brought forth the mystery of the incarnation, that it was love that caused Christ to be born of weak, passable flesh. It was love that inspired the hidden life of Nazareth and love that nourished, that nourished the zeal of his public life. See, all this was done by Christ for love of his Father and also for love of us. It was love that caused Christ to deliver himself up to the horrendous torture and crucifixion and humiliating death. When Christ rose for the dead, from the dead, it was out of love for us, for our justification, as scripture says, and as the one outstanding proof that we have for life beyond the grave. When Christ ascends into heaven, it is to prepare a place for us, again, actions motivated by love. It was love that caused Christ to send us the Holy Ghost so as not to leave us orphans. It is love for Christ that caught, it is the love of Christ that caused him to found his one true Catholic Church and in founding the seven sacraments and establishing most important of all the blessed sacrament. All these mysteries of Christ have their source in love. It is love that inspired and brought forth them all. Again, we hear the words of our Lord to St. Margaret Mary. Behold the heart that has loved men so much. Point number two, what is the one driving force that motivated all of the apostles and especially that motivated St. Paul? Answer again, it is love. Think about how much difficulty St. Paul, uh, 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 think about the difficulties he went through while preaching the gospel. And in 2 Corinthians, he tells us some of his troubles. The fact that he was often brought near to death Five times he received 39 strokes from the Jews, was beaten with rods three times, was shipwrecked three times, and once his enemies tried to kill him by stoning. In journeying often, he writes, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils from my own nations, in the perils in the city, in the perils of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils from false brethren, in labors and painfulness, in much watching, in hunger, thirst, fasting, cold, and nakedness. But if you ask him, asked him how he endured all these sufferings, St. Paul will answer as he writes in scripture, but in all these things we have overcome because of him who has loved us, close quote. So you can see that what sustains and strengthens and animates and stimulates St. Paul in the face of all these di difficulties is the conviction of the love that Christ bears towards him. See, and this is the key to understanding the heroic work of this great apostle. Again, behold the heart that has loved men, so loved men. Last question, number three. What is the one primary element that all the various devotions to the person of Christ have in common? Answer again, it is love. The various devotions, no matter what they may be, the various devotions, they will always have a particular perfection of our Lord that is the subject of a special adoration. And we have, but we have to admit again that in all these devotions, it is love that inspired them all. And this is what we mean. That if we have devotion to the infant Jesus, we must remember that it was love that caused Christ to become a helpless baby born in poverty and humiliation and suffering. If we have devotion to the holy face, we can't forget that it was love that caused Christ to allow his face to be beaten and disfigured. If we have devotion to the holy wounds, we must keep in mind that it was love that caused Christ to receive these, these outrageous wounds. And if we have devotion to the precious blood, we know that it was love that caused Christ to shed his precious blood that was the price of our redemption. You see, love inspired it all. And this is why devotion to the Sacred Heart is paramount, because if all the other mysteries and devotion of Christ have their source in the love of Christ, uh, and if devotion to the heart of Christ is the symbol of that love, 
then devotion to the Sacred Heart is the most excellent and preeminent of all other devotions, because in it we venerate the very heart of Christ, in which we honor the love that inspired all of Christ's mysteries and all of Christ's gifts to us. And also, this is not to denigrate the devotion to the Immaculate Heart. As Cornelia quoted St. John Hughes, devotion to the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart of Mary are so close that they're practically one. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the time for a thorough treatment of Abbot Marmion's writings on the Sacred Heart. But I want to move on because no discussion of the Sacred Heart is complete without a mention of the Twelve Promises. Now, in a magnificent work on the subject, a Jesuit priest named Father McDonald, he points out that the Twelve Promises of the Sacred Heart far surpass in variety, universality, and importance those promises to attach to any other devotions in the church. He points out that they are, they are addressed to all sorts of persons, the fervent, the weak, the tepid, the sinful. They embrace every condition of life, whether it be priests, religious, or seculars. They promise relief to the afflicted, strength to the tempted, consolation to the sorrowful, peace to the family, and blessings to the home. And even Pope Leo XIII, in his apostolic letter on the Sacred Heart, I think it was on the Sacred Heart of June 23, 1899, he refers to the promises of great favors regarding the Sacred Heart. Now, you've probably read uh, over uh, the 12 promises to the Sacred Heart a hundred times, but it never hurts to hear them again. And sometimes hearing them out loud has a completely different effect from just reading them yourself. The 12 promises of the Sacred Heart read as follows. First, number one, I will give them all the graces necessary for their state in life. Number two, I will give peace to their families. Number three, I will console them in their troubles. Number four, they shall find in my heart an assured refuge during life and especially at the hour of death. Number five, I will pour abundant blessings on all their undertakings. Number six, sinners shall find in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. Seven, tepid, that is lukewarm souls, shall become fervent. Eight, fervent souls shall speedily rise to great perfection. Number nine, I will bless homes in which the image of my sacred heart shall be exposed and honors, honored. Uh, no home really should be without an image of the sacred heart. I especially um, um, advocate the consecration, the enthronement of the sacred heart in the home. And uh, it's interesting that in his great encyclical on the kingship of Christ, uh, Quas Primus, Pope Pius XI urged Catholics to practice this enthronement of the Sacred Heart in their homes. So we see that the Pope teaches that the kingship of Christ in society and the, uh, the, king and the, the devotion to the Sacred Heart are inseparably linked. Anyway, number 10, I will give priests, I will give to priests the power to touch the most hardened hearts. 11, those who propagate this devotion shall have their name written in my heart and it shall never be effaced. Number 12, I promise thee in the excess of my mercy, of the mercy of my heart, that as all powerful love will grant to all those who receive communion on the first Friday of every month for nine consecutive months, the grace of final repentance, they shall not die under my displeasure, nor without receiving their sacraments, and that my heart shall be their secure refuge at the last hour. Close quote. Now, along with the 12 promises, there was another promise that was contained in one last grand revelation of the Sacred Heart to St. Margaret, Margaret Mary in 1689. And this one last revelation, I think, beyond the shadow of all doubt, uh, shows and demonstrates the power as well as the authenticity of devotion to the Sacred Heart. Now, I know that everyone here in this room is familiar, of course, with the message of Fatima, and particularly Our Lady's request for the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart. Now, we know that as early as 1931, it seems that heaven was growing impatient that this request had not yet been fulfilled. And in that year, reporting the communication to her bishop, 
Sister Lucy said that our Lord told her, quote, make known to my ministers that if they, fo if they follow the example of the King of France in delaying the execution of my requests, they will follow him into misfortune, close quote. Five years later, Sister Lucy would write, quote, our Lord complainingly said to me, they did not want to heed my requests. Like the King of France, they will repent and do so, but it will be late. Russia will have already spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and, per and persecutions of the church. The Holy Father will have much to suffer, close quote. Like a good parent, our, uh, a good parent always follows through with its rewards, but also a good parent always follows through with its threats. And our Lord is reminding uh, his ministers that just as the King of France uh, suffered for delaying the request, so too in our own time. Because what our Lord was referring to in this 1931 message to Sister Lucy was the little known fact that in, in 1689, our Lord requested through St. Margaret Mary that the King consecrate France to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, promising him that if this were done, the King would receive the divine protection against his enemies, and this is uh, how our Lord put it, visible and invisible. Now, in 1689, here's what St. Margaret Mary wrote. She said, our Lord desires to enter with pomp and magnificence into the palaces of the kings and princes. This is the doctrine of the social kingship of Christ, by the way, but uh, we can't go into that now. Anyway, our Lord desires to enter with pomp and magnificence into the palaces of kings and princes, therein to be honored as much as he has been despised, humiliated, and outraged in his passion. May he receive as much pleasure therein as seeing the great ones of the world abasing and humbling themselves before him as he once felt bitterness at beholding himself annihilated at their feet. And of course, there's no doubt here that uh, our Lord is referring to the humiliating treatment he received at the hands of Pontius Pilate and King Herod at the time of his passion. Anyway, Margaret Mary writes that our Lord said, quote, make known to the eldest son of my heart, that is speaking to the king, that as his temporal birth was obtained through the devotion to the merits of my holy childhood, in the same manner, he will obtain his birth of grace and eternal glory by the consecration that he will make of himself to my adorable heart, which, which, which wishes to triumph over his heart and by his mediation over those of the great ones of the world. It wishes to reign in his palace, to be painted on his standards and engraved on his arms in order to, him, in order to render him victorious over all his enemies, close quote. Now, in another one of the six letters that St. Margaret Mary wrote on the subject, here's what she says. She says, the Eternal Father, wishing to repair the bitterness and agony that the adorable heart of his divine son endured in the places of earthly princes amidst the humiliations and outrages of his passion, he wishes to establish his empire in the heart of our great monarch of whom he desires to make us in the execution of his designs to have an edifice erected in which shall be erect in which shall be a picture of his divine heart to receive consecration and homage of the king and all his court moreover this divine heart wishes to make itself the defender of the sacred person of the king his protector against his enemies visible and invisible and further it is by this divine heart, Margaret Mary writes, that God wishes to dispense the treasures of his grace and sanctification and salvation by, dis by bestowing his benediction on the king's undertakings, according a happy success to his arms and making him triumph over all the malice of his enemies." Close quote. Now, in the light of history, there was no doubt that these enemies referred to were the forces of Freemasonry that would orchestrate the French Revolution and sweep away the monarchy and with it all other monarchies and eventually all Catholic influence in society. Now our Lord made it clear to St. Margaret Mary that the Jesuit Father de Lachey, who was King Louis XIV's confessor, that he had been chosen by God to see to the execution of his designs. Here's what St. Margaret Mary wrote. 
quote, by virtue of the power he had given him over the heart of our great king, the success of the matter depended on him, close quote. Now, there are scholars like the Jesuit father Guiton, who was writing on the subject in 1858. He is now determined with near certainty the unbelievable fact that the king's confessor never relayed these messages to the king. And whatever consecrations may have been done, they were only done privately, and they didn't fulfill the request. It has been said that the reason for this was that the Jesuit father at the time was known to be formally hostile, excuse me, uh, was known to be formally hostile to the devotion to the Sacred Heart, and this may be, this is probably the reason of, uh, for um, the king's confessor's regrettable caution. But there is a tradition of the French visitation nuns that holds for certain that Louis XIV did learn the desires of the Sacred Heart through other channels. It was seen that if his spiritual director would have been more indulgent to St. Margaret Mary and to her requests, the king would have, been, would have complied. The fact is, is that the king did not fulfill this request in 1689, and neither did any of his successors. As a consequence, the king and his descendants did not receive the divine protection granted by our Lord. In 1789, 100 years later, 100 years after the prediction, prediction was in 1689, in 1789, we witnessed the fall of the French monarchy with the French Revolution, in which King Louis the Sixteenth was sent to the guillotine along with his wife, Marie Antoinette. Our Lord is still waiting for the consecration of France to his sacred heart, a consecration that would have protected the king from his enemies and thus would have prevented the French Revolution. Now, this is, is actually is, is of utmost significance because the French Revolution was not just a French revolution, uh, as if the revolution in that country had no ramification beyond French boundaries. Those who inaugurated it knew very well what they were doing, and they knew exactly what they were fighting against. The revolution of 1789 was actually a revolution against the divine plan for order in society and a, declaration against uh, and a declaration of war against Christ, his church, and Christian civilization. Now, you have to understand that a true Catholic king knows his catechism. If you would ask a, a true Catholic king, who made you? The king would say, God made me. If you asked him, sire, why did God make you? His majesty would answer it the same way that a seven-year-old peasant would answer. God made me to know, love, and serve him in this world so as to be happy with him forever in the next. If you would ask him, from whom do we learn to know, love, and serve God? The king would reply, from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who teaches us through the Catholic Church. If you asked him, sire, who do you rule over? The king would say, I rule over men. If you asked him, what is man? He would answer as the Catechism answers. Man is a creature made in the image and likeness of God, composed of body and soul. See, the point I'm getting at is, is that a true Catholic king will govern his realm with the truths of the faith firmly in his mind and his heart. And as, and as a result, the king will base his laws of right and wrong, hopefully, on what the gospel teaches as right and wrong, and on what the church teaches as right and, and wrong. He will have a society in which the laws of God and the laws of government are in perfect harmony. Now, this is what we call, of course, Christendom, or Christian civilization. And that is why I said that these forces of organized naturalism who orchestrated the French Revolution were not so much warring against the person of Louis XVI, but against Christian civilization altogether, because it is the self-proclaimed goal of these forces, namely Freemasonry, it is their self-proclaimed goal to lift civilization off of its Christian foundation and place it on one of pure naturalism in which God has no place. If anyone wants uh, more reading on this, read Pope Leo XIII's encyclical Humanum Genus. There's some available in the store on Freemasonry. It spells it out completely. 
Now, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that the primary sin of the devil, which condemned him to hell without recourse, is that he, the devil, he wanted to be the source of his own happiness, independent from God. And St. Thomas Aquinas also teaches that this was the primary sin of Adam and Eve, that in pursuing that which was forbidden, they wanted to be the granters of their own happiness, independent from God. So we can see a perfect parallel in the forces behind the French Revolution, because it, it, bases its rev, it bases its revolution on a false compassion, the false compassion of liberty, equality, and fraternity, as if Christ and his, and his Holy Church were enemies of liberty, adversaries of equality, and opponents of true fraternity. These men want the brotherhood of men without the fatherhood of God. They want the rights of men without the rights of God. And like the devil, they think they can be granters of their own happiness and build a social utopia by warring against Christ and his divine plan for order. It is no wonder then, as Father Dennis Fahey reports, that the devil, speaking through the possessed children of Ilford and an exorcism that took place in mid-19th century, the devils, speaking through these children, said, long live liberty, equality, and fraternity. That is the favorable time for us. The effects of the destruction of Christian civilization caused primarily uh, the breaking of Christendom that started with the Protestant revolt and more completely by the French Revolution can be seen in today's widespread liberalism and religious indifferentism in which our modern social order boasts as if it's something to be proud of. We see it all around us. Men and women believe they can be granters of their own happiness without God and the fact that modern man is now embracing the evils of abortion, contraception, widespread immorality, eugenics, homosexuality, religious indifferentism, and looking upon this slavery of sin as some sort of newfound freedom, this can be directly traced to that crucial event which clinched the downfall of Christian civilization, the French Revolution. And according to all the signs, the sacred heart of Jesus, in which there is true and perfect compassion, operating through St. Margaret Mary and the King of France, could have prevented this catastrophe. But, in light of all this, we do have the promise of the Sacred Heart that he will reign in spite of his enemies. And we still await the consecration of France to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Uh, even Marshal Pitain in the last century admitted this. He said, where the consecration of France to the Sacred Heart is concerned, only the King of France is qualified to make it in order to give it full force. I am only the chief of state. I am not the king. And I think you'll find this fascinating. In 1972, a confidant and, and part-time secretary of Padre Pio, Solange Hurst reported this. He related the following. He said, Padre Pio knew that in France is hidden a power which will reveal itself at the appointed hour. Only the royal power, the one God gave David, is capable of ruling governments. And there's a tradition uh, that the French kings are the new line of David. I'm not French, by the way, if you're trying. <laughs> anyway, without David's royal power properly recognized and in place, the Christian religion does not have the indispensable support it needs to uphold the truths of God's power. Because you have to remember, in a Catholic uh, kingdom, the Catholic civilization, the government actually protects the church. Can you imagine Bill Clinton? <laughs> I'm your friend. <laughs> God's power no longer resides in the hearts of ministers and heads of state. How great will be the world's misfortune before men understand this truth? That's from uh, Padre Pio's close friend and confidant. Uh, but in any case, as Solange Hurst wrote in her marvelous chapter on the political dimensions of the Sacred Heart, Sooner or later, she writes, Christ the King will deal with utopia. Now, the last point I want to make is, needs to be said, in that because you see a heart, don't be fooled into thinking that this is some sort of flowery, a womanly devotion whose purpose is more decoration than substance. There is nothing effeminate or sentimental about devotion to the Sacred Heart, 
This is a devotion based on hard rock realities, the hard rock realities of the love of Christ, not manifesting itself in flowery words and pretty slogans, but in the hard rock reality of a crown of thorns thrusting through bone and skull and cracking and gouging the forehead from the inside out. It's as, it's as hard and as real as torturous nails the size of railroad spikes being driven into a man's palms and feet from the powerful blows of handheld sledgehammers held in the hands of strong, pitiless professional executioners who lost their compassion for human suffering years ago. This is a devotion of divine loving, love coming from a God powerful enough to make the entire earth and universe out of nothing. A no-nonsense devotion of divine charity and power of which many of our liberal, modernist, progressivist theologians and theologianettes have absolutely no understanding. This is a power strong enough to keep Catholic monarchs on their thrones and Catholic kingdoms intact. It is, a, is, it is the devotion that gives strong souls the grace to keep going and weak, sinful souls the grace to conquer their evil inclinations. Back in the flower power of 60s, the Beatles, who wrote most of their songs while intoxicated on LSD, the Beatles sang to the world that all you need is love. All right? And in the parallel, and around the same time, Many progressivist clergy, not all, but many progressivist clergy who were in the state of, who were also in a state of intoxication, not from drugs and alcohol spirits, but from the liberal quote unquote spirit of Vatican II, also preached a kind of all you need is love theology. I was in Catholic high school from 1972 to 1976. I received this type of thing firsthand. And this is a cheap, this all you need is love theology is a cheap counterfeit because even our loves have to be in proper order. Because remember, we don't lose our souls and go to hell because we fail to love. Because human nature is constituted in such a way there, we're always going to be loving something. We lose our souls and we go to hell because we love the wrong things. Because we, uh, because we think about the wrong things and we develop an attachment and an appetite for the wrong things. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make our hearts like unto thine. Let that be the aspiration that is cons constantly that we pray in our minds. This was the secret of the Blessed Mother, and it was the secret of the saints, in that they loved the same things that Christ loved. And because of this, they developed a true and heaven-sent hunger for pursuing the right things, doing good, avoiding evil, uh, and growing in grace despite the difficulties encountered. The Sacred Heart of Jesus, joined with devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary that God wants to establish in the world, is the preeminent devotion capable of giving our weak, cowardly souls the strength and the courage and the drive for accomplishing this. We must read the 12 promises of the Sacred Heart and believe in them. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make our hearts like unto thine. Thank you for your attention.